Let me tell you about that <coughs> magnificent episode in, in human history. <coughs> the Commune de Paris. <laughs> the story starts with stupidity. <laughs> I'm speaking of Napoleon III, nephew of, of Bonaparte. He was a buffoon, a stage actor smiling to the crowds while 16 million French peasants lived in blind dark hovels, their children dying of starvation. But because he kept the legislature, because people voted, people thought that they had a democracy, a common mistake. Bonaparte wanted glory, so he made the mistake of attacking Bismarck's armies and <laughs> was quickly defeated. Whereupon the victorious German troops marched into Paris where they were met by something more devastating than guns, silence. <laughs> they found the statutes of Paris draped in black, an immense, invisible, silent resistance. <laughs> so. They did the vice thing. They paraded through the Arc de Triomphe and quickly departed. <laughs> the old French order, the Republic, ha, liberals, they called themselves, they did not dare come into Paris. They trembled with fear because with the Germans gone, Paris was taken over by the workers, the housewives, the intellectuals, the clerks, the armed citizens. The people of Paris formed not a government, but something more glorious, something that governments everywhere fear a commune, the collective energy of the people. It was the commune de Paris. People were meeting 24 hours a day, everywhere, knots of three and four, making decisions together. For the city was surrounded by the French army threatening to invade at, at any moment. But Paris became the first free city in the world, the first enclave of liberty in a world of tyranny. If you want to know what I mean by the dictatorship of the proletariat, look at the Commune de Paris. That is a true democracy. <laughs> Not the democracy of England or America, where elections are circuses, where people are voting for one or another guardian of the old order, where whatever candidate wins, the rich go on ruling the country. <laughs> it was the Commune de Paris it only lived for a few months, but it was the first legislative body in history to represent the poor. Its laws were for them. It abolished their debts and postponed their rents. And it forced the pawn shops to return to their most necessary possessions. Their leaders refused to take salaries higher than the workers. They shortened the hours for bakers and planned how to give free admission to the theaters for everyone. And the great Corbet himself, whose paintings had stunned Europe, presided over the Federation of the Artists. They reopened the museums and set up a commission for the education of women, something unheard of, <laughs> the education of women. And they took advantage of the latest in science, the lighter-than-air balloon. They launched one from Paris to soar over the countrysides, dropping printed materials to the, to the peasants. For it's a simple, powerful message. Our interests are the same. <laughs> a message that should be dropped to workers everywhere in the world. And the commune declared the purpose of schools to teach the children to love and respect their fellow creatures. <laughs> I've read your endless discussions of education. What nonsense. It teaches everything necessary to succeed in a capitalist world. But does it teach the youth to struggle for justice? <laughs> the communards understood the importance of that. They taught not only with their words, but with their acts. They destroyed the guillotine, ha! that instrument of tyranny, <laughs> even revolutionary tyranny. <laughs> and then, wearing red scarves, carrying a huge red banner, Buildings festooned in sheets of red silk, they gathered around the Vendome column, that symbol of military power. A huge statue surmounted by the bronze head of Napoleon Bonaparte. A pulley was attached to the head, capstan turned, and the head came crashing to the ground, and people climbed over the ruins. 
a red flag now floated from the top of the pedestal. Now it was a pedestal not of one country, but of the whole human race. Men and women watching wept with joy. <laughs> that was the commune. The streets were always full. Discussions were going on everywhere. People shared things. They seemed to smile more often. Kindness ruled. And the streets of Paris were safe with, without police of any kind. That is socialism. <laughs> of course, that example of the commune could not be allowed. So the army of the Republic marched into Paris and commenced the slaughter. The leaders of the commune were taken to the Pierre Lachaise Cemetery and lined against the stone walls and, and shot. <laughs> Altogether, 30,000 people were killed. Ha! The commune was crushed by the wolves and swine, but it was the most glorious achievement of our time. <laughs> ha! They feared the commune. It was dangerous. It was too inspiring an example for the rest of the barrel, so they drowned it in blood. It, it still happens, does it not, that whenever in some corner of the barrel, people, innocent of ideology, just angry with their lives, push aside the old order and <laughs> commence to experiment with a new way of living, that it cannot be permitted. So they, yeah, you know who I mean by they, set about to destroy it, sometimes insidiously, covertly, sometimes directly and violently. <laughs>